Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove once again. I'm going to be having a conversation with myself. It's hard to know exactly where it's going to lead because it will be a spontaneous conversation. A spontaneous conversation with me, that is. But our general focus is going to be on the future evolution of humanity. And a really good starting point for this discussion will be to talk about the time I spent with a, a wonderful man I considered my mentor, Arthur M. Young. He died in 1995, over 25 years ago, but he had an enormous impact on my life, especially at a time when I was young and impressionable. Arthur Young developed a grid and the grid could be considered an extension of the periodic table of the elements, only it was really a periodic table of everything. It included subatomic particles. It included uh, spiritual ideas. It included plants, animals, humans, and uh, really even mythological structures. It was a very deep, penetrating insight into the nature of reality. You have to appreciate here who was this man, Arthur M. Young. He uh, was born, as I recall, in 1905, graduated from Princeton University, as I recall, in 1926. And at that time, uh, he had already been studying Einstein's theory of relativity. But when he got out of college, he went to the patent office in Washington, D.C. He wanted to find something that he could invent, some great idea that hadn't yet been invented. And the reason was that he wanted to be a philosopher. <laughs> But he thought to himself that the, the real problem with philosophy in that day is, is that it had failed to anticipate the importance of technology in our culture. And he felt that in order to prove himself worthy of being a philosopher, he had to show that he could master the physical universe, that he could solve a technical problem. And he settled in on the problem of a device that could hover in midair and fly in any direction, up, down, right, left, uh, what we call the helicopter. There had been apparently by 1926, some 200 unsuccessful efforts to, to develop such a machine. And uh, so he set about doing it in 1926. And um, in 1947, his first commercially licensed helicopter, the Bell Model 47, uh, came off the uh, assembly line. He succeeded in uh, creating the first commercially licensed helicopter, of course. There were other models. Uh, Sikorsky, I think, was a little ahead of him. He had a big lawsuit with Sikorsky, which, as I recall, he won because he had a unique design. And, and his helicopter received uh, the first commercial license to fly. But I think the important thing to talk about uh, with regard to Arthur Young and, and his penetrating insights is that he realized that the helicopter was symbolic of what he sometimes referred to as the psi-copter. The helicopter was a machine that would enable you to hover in midair or to move in any direction that you could think of in, in a three-dimensional uh, space. But he saw after that that w what was really essential was the development of the self, of the person, 
of each unique individual. And he saw the future evolution of humanity as being people evolving themselves in a psychic way. Really, I think of it these days as being able to maneuver through hyperspace. It's also important to mention at this time that Arthur Young developed a deep interest in UFOs, not just sightings, not just landings. He was very interested in UFO contactees. He kept a, a collection. Actually, I think what he did is he paid for the local public library in Berkeley near uh, the Institute for the Study of Consciousness, where I lived with him for a period of many months. Uh, he bought for the library a whole series of books about UFO contactees. And he would sometimes say to me, if he could start all over again, he'd love to build UFOs. But he was very interested in the inhabitants of these vehicles and the many reports, many reports of individuals who claimed that they'd had contact, that they'd even had lengthy conversations and a deep understanding of UFOs at that time. And you have to appreciate back in the 1970s, this was a hot topic for many reasons, as it still is today. We can look back over 50 years of of UFO activity and we see something very mysterious. We see something very elusive. We see something that maybe the government knows a lot more about than they're willing to tell us or maybe they don't. And, and maybe it's because the phenomenon is, is so <laughs> confounding that, that the government doesn't have a handle on it and all the secrecy is they don't want people to know how ignorant they actually are. I lean really more in that direction than in the direction of thinking that the government is hiding some big secret. The key here. I know the point that we're trying to get to is what are these UFOs doing? Why do they appear so mysteriously? Why are there all these rumors about hybrid races and people being abducted, but not clear evidence that people are being abducted? And in particular, the overlap, which I uh, recently reported on in, in, in one of my conversations with myself about aliens and deceased entities. What's going on there? Why is that so significant? Are they trying to give us some kind of a message? And it occurred to me recently that maybe I even have a clue as to what it is. Well, <laughs> are you ready to spill the beans? Okay. Think of it this way. Let's suppose that the human being is very much like the butterfly. Well, to be more accurate, very much like the caterpillar. We are in the larval stage of being human. We think that we uh, die. We think that at the, at the end of our life, we, we basically shed these bodies and who knows what. It's up to religion at that point to determine. And I think, uh, for example, a lot of Western religions basically take the attitude, well, when you die, you go into a permanent deep sleep until the day of the resurrection. So, there's no communication to speak of with deceased beings because they're sleeping, waiting for the resurrection. It's almost the same as the materialistic idea of when you die, you're dead because until the resurrection comes, you might as well be. So, so that's one, I would say, largely held vision. Newton. Isaac Newton, who was an alchemist, amongst other things, held to that vision. But suppose that what happens after death is like the butterfly emerging from the cocoon, you know, and, and uh, for all practical purposes, when a caterpillar enters into the uh, pupa, into the, uh, what becomes the cocoon, the caterpillar dies. It's the end of the caterpillar until the butterfly emerges. And the caterpillar typically doesn't have an idea 
about the butterfly, or does it? Because uh, there is this notion of the imaginal that somewhere, somewhere deep within the caterpillar is the image of the butterfly. And you might say, somewhere deep within each of us is the image of the powerful spiritual being. Gene Houston uses the term godlings that we will become. And perhaps the uh, beings, let's say beings on other planets, evolved human-like beings, they can have very different bodies, but they're human-like in the sense that they have self-consciousness and they have a certain amount of dominion over the physical world. They know how to create machines, for example. That was one of the interesting points, incidentally, that Arthur Young made. If you look at the animal kingdom, every animal is like a machine. They all have unique tools. A woodpecker, the elephant, <laughs> the birds that can fly, and, and so on. We have a very versatile body, but we have the ability to make tools. So, we don't have wings, but we build airplanes and helicopters. We don't have gills, but we can build submarines. <laughs> so, it's a whole other, in Arthur Young's thinking, a whole other kingdom, a kingdom of dominion, of consciousness. And actually, he confided to me, and uh, some people have a hard time swallowing this, it's the kingdom of gods. We are essentially evolving a godlike powers. And the next stage, the next stage for us is going to be consciousness of the cycles of birth and death, a conscious awareness of our future being, of our spiritual heritage, of our potentialities for psychic and spiritual functioning. And we're very far from that on a social level. But individually, I think it's fair to say many, many people, because of their religious backgrounds or because of their esoteric training or because perhaps of, of karma, you could say they were born with it, many individuals are perfectly well aware of this kind of psychic functioning. Yeah, they experience it on a regular basis. And the, the funny thing is this, if they talk too much about it, they might get put in a mental institution. Uh, the really good, smart ones keep it to themselves. I suspect, or they develop a career as, as a psychic or as a medium and uh, deal with the insults and abuses that are likely to come their way as a result of that. And uh, many people are very successful in that regard, although I don't think there's a single public psychic who hasn't been subject to a vicious attack. Even parapsychology researchers are. And I say that simply because that's a statement about the culture at large. That, you know, we're, how are we going to take an evolutionary leap when the culture jumps all over people who are ready to do that. So, the evolutionary leap is typically taken by individuals on an individual basis, not by humanity as a whole. But if we are to enter into a state as a species, as, as the uh, human population of planet Earth, where we can enter into regular ongoing contact and communication with alien beings from other planets, for example. Perhaps we have to jump up a level. Perhaps we have to acknowledge that we are multidimensional, hyperspatial, spiritual beings. That the death of the physical body is very little different than a snake shedding its skin, for example. Otherwise, we're not really Probably, we're not really their peers. If we expect them to be like us and they have kept their distance from us, for all we know, they genetically engineered us. Uh, maybe they did, but I don't think that matters. The point is, how evolved are we relative to our potential? It's that simple. The answer to me is that we are on the cusp as a society, as a human population of taking an evolutionary leap. That's what the UFO contacts seem to be 
implying to us through their mysterious behavior. That's what the 150-year research history in psychical research and parapsychology is suggesting to us. We are on the cusp of being able to do that. And, and by cusp, I think I'm thinking of maybe uh, over the next 100, 150 years. That really is a very short time uh, in uh, human evolution. That sort of settles things, doesn't it? You sort of nailed it down. You've made the point uh, that we're going to make. And maybe now it's time to say goodbye. So thank you for inviting me to be with you. Thank you for being with me. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us.